my eyes and give you Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Washington National Cathedral. I am Dana Corsello, the canon vicar of the cathedral, and on behalf of Marianne Buddy, our bishop, and our dean, Randy Hollerith, and of course, my colleagues, I want to welcome you all. This is the last Sunday of August. I think we're all trying to eke out that little bit of summer. We're so happy to see you all, and especially those of you who were worshiping online with us this morning, without you, our community would not be complete. And to those of you who are watching uh, with us this morning, it is not too late to register for homecoming. Homecoming is uh, a special weekend we're offering during Cathedral Day weekend for those pilgrims who've been watching online, who do not live in the district or Maryland or Virginia, who would like to come to Washington for special programming. So that's homecoming, and I hope you will join us. And now I want to point out one additional thing. The introit and the processional hymn are all about joy. Joy, 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 worshiping God with joy. And so I want to invite you all um, to center yourselves, but also be ready to join all of us as we uh, let the Holy Spirit shower upon us God's blessings, but of course, God's joy as we sing and welcome one another and usher in this beautiful worship. So again, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Yeah. 
Blessed be our God. Praying together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord of all power and might, the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name, increase in us true religion, nourish us with all goodness, and bring forth in us the fruit of good works. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Sirach. The beginning of human pride is to forsake the Lord. The heart has withdrawn from its maker. For the beginning of pride is sin, and the one who clings to it pours out abominations. Therefore, the Lord brings upon them unheard of calamities and destroys them completely. The Lord overthrows the thrones of rulers and enthrones the lowly in their place. The Lord plucks up the roots of the nations and plants the humble in their place. The Lord lays waste the lands of the nations and destroys them to the foundations of the earth. He removes some of them and destroys them and erases the memory of them from the earth. Pride was not created for human beings or violent anger for those born of women. The word of the Lord.
reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Let mutual love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them. Those who are being tortured as though you yourselves were being tortured. Let marriage be held in honor by all and let the marriage bed be kept undefiled for God will judge fornicators and adulterers. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Through him then, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. The word of the Lord. Santo Evangelio de nuestro Señor Jesucristo, según Lucas. Gloria a ti, Cristo Señor. Sucedió que un sábado Jesús fue a comer a casa de un jefe fariseo, y otros fariseos lo estaban espiando. Al ver Jesús como los invitados escogían los asientos de honor en la mesa, les dio este consejo. Cuando alguien te invite a un banquete de bodas, no te sientes en el lugar principal pues puede llegar otro invitado más importante que tú. Y el que los invitó a los dos puede venir a decirte, dale tu lugar a este otro. Entonces tendrás que ir con vergüenza a ocupar el último asiento. Al contrario, cuando te inviten, siéntate en el último lugar, para que cuando venga el que te invitó, te diga, amigo, pásate un lugar de más honor. Así recibirás honores delante de los que están sentados contigo a la mesa. 
porque el, el que a sí mismo se engrandece será humillado, y el que se humilla será engrandecido. Dijo también el hombre que lo había invitado, Cuando des una comida o una cena, no invites a tus amigos, ni a tus hermanos, ni a tus parientes, ni a tus vecinos ricos, porque ellos, a su vez, te invitarán, y así quedarás ya recompensado. Al contrario, cuando tú des un banquete, invita a los pobres, los inválidos, los cojos y los ciegos, y serás feliz. Pues ellos no te pueden pagar, pero tú tendrás tu recompensa el día en que los justos resucitan. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He also said to one who invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The Gospel of the Lord. Won't you join me in a word of prayer? God Almighty, we come on this morning grateful for your love towards us, your presence with us. Once again, we ask that you would hold us, that you would unite us, but most of all, fill us for the places you are preparing to send us. This we ask in your wonderful name, amen. Once again, it is a joy to be in this place, to be in worship. As we journey through life and as we move through life, it is the moment of gathering, the moment of assembling, it is the moment of being in God's presence that makes a difference, not in just our thoughts, but in our actions. Certainly this morning, as we listen to the Gospel of Luke, I'm often reminded that Luke stands alone among the four Gospels of the New Testament in starting his Gospel with an explanation of its purpose and his purpose for writing this account. For just a moment, I call to those who are familiar to remember and for those who might not be as familiar to listen to Luke's opening words as he stated, many have undertaken to draw up an account of things that have been fulfilled among us. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, 
Since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decide to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that have been taught. In that day, and continuing until this day, think for a moment how much has been said, how much has been written, how much has been considered, and how much has even been concluded about this man named Jesus. How much has been said, written, considered, and concluded about his life, his witness, about Calvary, the cross, and of course, his resurrection. Luke's desire for Theophilus, as well as the others who might share in its reading and hearing, was that they might know with some degree of certainty about the things that had been taught, had been heard, and had been said about this man named Jesus. Luke knew that if there was an uncertainty about who Jesus is, there would be an uncertainty in all that his followers would do, how they would act, what they would believe, not just individually, but collectively. There would be uncertainty in the person as well as in the church, and both would be greatly compromised. Today, the questioning, the examining, the speculating, the ex assessing, the investigating is still taking place as the life of Jesus is evaluated. But perhaps in this day, it's not just his life, as we see in this text, that's being evaluated. We've come evaluating his life. And as the text says, watching closely, but perhaps in this day, it is the life of his followers, the committed, the convicted, the self-declared disciples who are being examined day by day. There are many who are not just looking at the life of Christ. They're, let me make it plain, looking at us. Sooner or later, it is what we do that matters. It is what we do that will make the difference. Lessons learned have their greatest witness in the actions that are done. I love God, but don't speak to my neighbor. I want to be kind, but only to those who I know and familiar with. I want to help those who are needy, but only the ones who I think are deserving of it. Luke tells us in this 14th chapter of his gospel that on a particular Sabbath, Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee. He, being Jesus, was being watched carefully. When he went in the door, I can imagine that there were many who were watching him, talking about him, gazing at him. They had all their eyes on him. Those who had been invited and were in attendance were most likely watching him and perhaps listening to the conversations and the words shared from Jesus that are even not part of the record and beyond what Luke was capturing. But while they were watching him, what they failed to realize and what they failed to grasp was that Jesus was watching them. There are many of us who have our eyes on someone else, but this morning, perhaps what we need to be aware of is that he has his eyes on us, watching to see how we entered the door, 
watching to see how we treated our families, watching to see how we jockeyed or positioned for places perhaps when we came in here, how we spoke to not those who are familiar to us, but those who are strangers to us, those who may have been dressed differently from us, those who sounded or had an accent that was not familiar to us. Perhaps we were watching around us, but he's watching what's taking place inside of us. Troubling to think about for just a moment because now we have to think about what we did when we walked in the door, which is a good thing. What we do when we're sitting next to someone who we may not know, behind someone who we have not yet met, in front of someone who we have not even turned around to say good morning to. We're watching him, but he's watching us. Jesus was listening to what they may have been saying, but he was more concerned to what, about what they were doing. I can sound good in my reading, but can I be good in my living? I might be sound, sound good in so, perhaps saying certain phrases that are familiar, but am I good into those and good to those who really need to know there's good in this world? While we are in this place, those who are online, those who will be watching at a later moment somewhere as you're traversing the highways and byways of life. What I want to remind us all is while we're waiting on God, examining the life of Christ and hoping to be filled and empowered with the Spirit, while we're sitting and moving, watching and waiting, we should never forget that what we do is being watched. Let me put it this way. Being a member of a family that was connected and routinely involved in church, I grew up in church. I spent a great amount of time at the church growing up. And I must say, I do not say that out of pain or problem or anything like that. I'm perhaps one of those that enjoyed going. One of those that enjoyed being in the company and in the community. And I, I don't say it with any kind of remorse, but with great appreciation for that Brooklyn community of faith I was part of. I will never forget sitting in the church office one day, sitting with my aunt and God bless her, who is 98 years old this year. As I sat with her, as she was one of the church administrators in the office on this hot and humid day during the summer where the heat was filled and filled the atmosphere and the breeze was not so swift in its movement. We were sitting in the office and waiting for someone to show up. The pastor of the church was downstairs in the offices with us. He was in those operation offices as we waited particularly for the air conditioning repairman to show up. Many of you perhaps are more comfortable with central air, but there are still those, many of us, who recognize the standard was more of your window units that had to be in. And when they broke down, you needed the repairman to come fix it. So we were sitting in the hot office and talking in the hot office. He was making us all laugh and joke while he was waiting in the office for the repairman to arrive. And here, the repairman arrived to restore the, and fix the malfunctioning window air conditioning unit, the unit that was not operating the way that it really needed to operate, the unit that here was not giving us the kind of atmosphere that we really wanted to get. And so everyone is focused on, of course, his repair. As the repairman walked in, I distinctly remember to this day the repairman coming in, looking around, trying to take note of who was in the place, who was around him. He looked, he took notice uh, of perhaps this young man who was in there, my aunt at that particular time. He took notice of someone else who was moving around, but of course he recognized and knew that the pastor was there after all of the appropriate introductions. As he quickly went to work, it was not long before the parts and pieces started to present him with a challenge. He pulled out tool after tool until he finally started hammering on the air conditioning. As is often the case with hammering, he missed his intended target. 
sharply and directly hit one of his fingers. And as you can imagine, in that moment, he let out a shout of one of those good four-letter Sunday school words. I would repeat it, but I can't in this moment. But he let out a shout that to this day made us all look up, made us all focus in on the work that he was doing. The repairman shook his hand, quickly remembered the people in the room, turned to my pastor, and immediately apologized for his outbursts. In that moment, I also will never forget my pastor's immediate response when he said, don't mind me. If you don't mind God hearing you, you shouldn't mind me hearing you. How many of us live in a day right now where we're more concerned about who's watching on social media than who's looking down from above? How many of us are more concerned with how we dress for the folk who we may meet in passing, but not the God who holds us in his hand? How many of us are more concerned about how we impress others rather than being good to others? It had not occurred to this repairman that while he was watching us in the office, that God was watching him. He was in church, in a regal place, but it had not filled his mind that God was looking down. We're in this place paying attention to stone, paying attention to windows, looking at strangers, familiar faces, but are we yet reminded that God is watching us? Luke shares with us how Jesus saw them rushing for prominent seats only to be called out as Jesus shared the parable with them. Their humility, their hospitality, and might I add, their honesty and sincerity was being exposed. Luke reminds us of this fact as Jesus speaks to the Pharisee that invited him and told him to look at how you have invited your friends. You invited your brothers, your sisters, your relatives, your, your rich neighbors, so that they may invite you back so that you will be repaid in some manner. Jesus told him plainly, but when you give a banquet, Jesus told him, you need to invite the poor, the cripple, the lame, and then you will be blessed. The religious leader's invitation was guided by what he could get, not by what he could give. This leader was more concerned with being transactional rather than relational. What he and his guests were doing was vital to the claims that were being made in that day. The witness that was needed and the lives that would be touched, the homes that would be in need of hope, that were in need of help as well as transformation. In these days, we must ask ourselves, when did caring for the poor, caring for the needy, caring for the cripple, caring for the lame, caring for the hungry, caring for the sick, helping the stranger, become actions that were seen as lesser and minor priorities for those who claim to be disciples? When did it become budgetary discussions of who to help first. We have this opportunity and every day to follow Christ. We have this moment not just to be hearers but to be doers. When everyone is talking about blessings, looking for a blessing, we should seek first to be a blessing to those who are struggling the most. All of our talk about God's love is an empty mouthing of words unless that strange and incomprehensible love of God, which was in actuality in Christ Jesus, becomes actuality in us and in our relations with those whom we have to work with, live with day by day. In just a few moments, we'll be invited to the table. In just a few moments, we'll gather around, not so that we can be impressive to each other, but we've been invited because we're the ones who are needy. 
We're the ones who in some ways are broken. We're the ones who need to be invited to be welcomed. We're the ones who have to love each other, maybe even more than we've loved ourselves. We're the ones that have to get beyond here the economic subjugation of others, the racism between each other. We're the ones that are in need of help, but he's inviting us to his table. And maybe we ought not think too much of ourselves, but to count ourselves as the needy, the broken, the hurting, and invite others to join us in every day beyond this day. I'm thankful for the good news that God is watching us. I didn't say it so it would disturb us in the wrong way, but disturb us and comfort us at the same time. He's watching us. He's looking down on us. He's present with us. And while what we do will always not be perfect, we can do better than what we've done. While what we're doing is not always exactly as it should be, we can strive to do better than what we have done. I'm thankful for his grace and his mercy. I'm thankful for his love and his joy. I'm thankful for his forgiveness and his welcome. I'm thankful that he's looking down and watching those who are most in need. I'm thankful and reminded when I think about those days of growing up, how we always found our hope when I would hear in the midst of a struggling moment, why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. That great songwriter said his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. And one thing I know, I know he watches me. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. 
We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Creator God, you call us to love and serve you with body, mind, and spirit through loving our sisters, brothers, and siblings. Open our hearts in compassion and receive these petitions on behalf of the church, the world, and all those in need. For the church in all its diverse forms and every place, that it may be strengthened to boldly proclaim the gospel of Christ to the ends of the earth. Lord, in your mercy. For the beauty and abundance of creation, make us good stewards to use the resources of the earth wisely, generously, and respectfully for the sake of generations to come. For those in places around the world affected by tropical storms and wind, fire, and flood, give them courage and hope in their troubles. Lord, in your mercy. For the peoples of all nations and for the peace of the world, especially in Ukraine, in all those places experiencing war and conflict, we pray for Joseph, President of the United States, and all in positions of public trust, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person. Lord, in your mercy. For all who cry out in their affliction, the hungry, downcast, and the sick, grant your compassion to those with chronic illnesses and COVID-19, the poor, oppressed, and persecuted. Heal the suffering and comfort the grieving. Lord, in your mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, we remember those who've lost their lives to COVID-19, gun violence, racial injustice, or any form of hatred. Bring us with them to dwell in your presence forever. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We've not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. Once again, greetings to all of you. I'm Jan Cope, the Provost of the Cathedral, and we're so delighted that you are with us in worship today. And we know that you come from many places. How many of you are visiting us today at the Cathedral? Wonderful. It's great to have you with us. At this time in our service, we move from the Ministry of the Word to the Ministry of the Table. And this is God's table. And as such, all are welcome. At that point in the service, follow the directions of the usher to receive communion. 
We are offering gluten-free bread for those of you who request it. We are also offering the cup, the chalice with wine. We ask that you not dip, um, but to take a sip from the cup if you desire. And if you'd prefer not to receive the cup, that's totally fine. And if you'd prefer not to receive communion, that's also totally fine. But we hope that you will come forward when others do so that we might offer you a prayer and a blessing. Every time we gather in a house of God, we have the opportunity to reflect on the myriad ways in which God showers blessings on us day by day and week by week. And as we reflect on those blessings, we have the opportunity to give back out of thanksgiving for all that God has done for us. And we invite you, if you are able to partner with this cathedral, as we seek to reach out to a hurting city and nation in the world. We thank those of you online who've been so generous with us the past few years. And if you are able to partner with us, we thank you in advance for that as well. But first and foremost, please support your own local worshiping community of faith. And now walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. Right now 
The Lord be with you. 
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets and their courses, and this fragile Earth, our island home. From the primal elements who brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill, you made us the rulers of creation but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Again and again you called us to return. Through prophets and sages you revealed your righteous law, and in the fullness of time you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who've looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. And so, Father, we who've been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit, now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the night before he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this, for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving. Lord God of our fathers and mothers, God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Hagar, Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, and Rachel, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, 
through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
praying together, Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Life is short, and we don't have much time to gladden the hearts of those who journey with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen.
us bless the Lord.